couples uh, who have who, who are here for the um, first time we organize it in the arcus uh, framework the arcus is a european multilateral alliance of seven european universities and if we go from north to south it's um bergen vilnius leipzig lyon graz and granada uh, I don't want to go more into detail about the, the, the network, but I put a link into the chat for, so for those of you who are interested. Um, please have a look at our website, what we are doing. And our webinar is, um, um, is organized by the Task Force Enabling Refugees, which is part of the Action Line 2, Inclusion and Diversity. And I think our Action Line Chair, Benedetta, might be also here. Um, she's not here it? yet, but she's coming. <laughs> and welcome Lucia, <laughs> she's also part of the organization team. Um, so for today's session, uh, we chose the topic um, learning on the margins, programs for students and scholars at risk. And uh, while our task force is called Enabling Refugees, um, this time here in our second webinar, uh, we wanted to set ourselves apart a little bit from the more narrow concept of um, supporting refugees or refugee students in order to talk more about support programs for persons at risk as uh, so on a more broader level and also what we can actually do to promote more academic and research freedom um, especially uh, with the current political tensions and situations going on in countries like um, belarus afghanistan ethiopia or turkey and we wanted to incorporate this into our um, task force work as well. So what actually happened was when we stayed, some of us stayed um, in, at Vilnius University in Lithuania last month for a big conference. And we actually, a lot of us learned um, about the situation, what's going on at the border to Belarus. And I think um, today it's, it's safe to say that according to the news, if we all follow up the news, that the situation developed into a humanitarian crisis uh, at the European border, and this concerns us all. So we decided, and this is also ARCOS um, as a network to raise awareness, that we invite a distinguished guest speaker from the University of Vilnius um, to explain a little bit more about the political background and historical background and why a situation like this can actually occur at the border of uh, Poland and Lithuania. And after the presentation for you, we still have some time for a Q&A session. So if you have questions, you can um, ask our speaker um, after that. And after we are done with the first topic, we will have three more presentations. And this is more about um, uh, at-risk programs that are already in, in place at three different universities. Um, before we start and before I hand over to Toma, my colleague from Vilnius University, I wanted to kindly remind you um, to switch off your microphone uh, when you're not speaking and also that this session um, will be recorded. So for those of you who do not want to be recorded and do not want to be on the Arcos platform for the, or the YouTube channel, you might switch off your camera. For questions, if you have questions for the presentations, you can please put them into the chat. And for the three presentations for the programs at risk, we try to find some time to ask um, after, the, uh, after our presentations or after our breakout sessions. So once we are done with the presentations, we will have a short coffee break, and then we can go into discussions into the breakout rooms about our topic today. So that's all for now from my side. and. Um, if you don't have any more questions, I would hand over to Tomara. So hello all and thank you Stephanie for the introduction. So I would like to present our first speaker, uh, Davila Yaknunite, from, uh, at, who is a professor at the Institute of International Relations and Political Science of Vilnius University. She's also the head of the Institute's International Relations uh, department and her main research fields and expertise fields of expertise are foreign policy analysis uh, Russian foreign policy conflicts in 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 Georgia and Ukraine Eastern Europe uh, 
European Union and Eastern uh, partnership theories. So we believe that um, it, it, she's a perfect speaker for us to, to talk, to discuss about the issues uh, and, and the problems uh, and the situation happening at the borders. So um, once again, as, as Stephanie said, we will have some Q and A, a short Q and A session. And uh, thank you, Davila, once again for being here. And we are looking forward to, to your presentation and comment about the geopolitical situation reasons and, and your point of view. Thank you. Good morning. Good day. Thank you, Toma. So it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, and I hope you hear me all, all right. Okay. If if something is not right, please tell me. Uh, so uh, of course we are we here in Lithuania follow very closely what's happening uh, what's happening at the border because it's also happening here. Uh, and as I have 15 minutes, I just in the beginning I show some uh, maps and slides, uh, and then we'll turn off and continue my talk uh, just to present some context. Uh, so I will turn some short. Okay. <clears throat> so I will take. Okay. So uh, the most important, I think, uh, to start with, we have we are talking about eastern uh, eastern uh, border of uh, of the EU, and in general, eastern border of the EU is uh, is pretty long. It's like considered 6,000 6, kilometers. Uh, uh, and it's uh, it, it starts from uh, from Finland goes to to to, to Mediterranean, and uh, it is important uh, like it is the recent slide from Frontex, and you can see the most important number that uh, one thousand four hundred percent increase of uh, irregular crossings uh, at the border, and uh, what was happening before before twenty twenty one, this uh, this this part of the EU border was considered uh, pretty low intensity, as you can say, uh, if, if you can say so. And uh, most of the people who are, were crossing border mostly were crossing border through Ukraine. I don't know if you see my, uh, from Ukraine to Poland and to Romania. And uh, usually the people were from Eastern Europe, like Ukraine and some selves or some from, uh, from, uh, uh, from Russia, from, from, from uh, Commonwealth of Independent State States. But and usually this uh, this border was considered problematic not in the context of irregular immigration but in the context of uh, smuggling uh, of smuggling uh, drugs, uh, uh, cigarettes, and uh, human trafficking as, as well. And only in this year, 2020, 2021, we see uh, the change of the focus totally. And uh, currently, we're talking about three states, three borders: uh, with Belarus. We talk, uh, we're talking about Lithuania, which has longest border with Belarus. It's like 680 uh, 80, 80 kilometers, uh, and, it's, and you can, if you can see on the map, it's, it's very curvy. It's very uh, and it has these kind of appendixes where it's easier to cross and so on. Besides, this border is like uh, mostly forests. It's uh, and it's. Uh, dark and damp and so on. Uh, another, Poland has second longest border with Belarus. It's uh, different estimations, but around 400 uh, kilometers, quite pretty long, but also very like comfortable and uh, straightforward. And Latvia has uh, le less than 200 kilometers. And as you see, the Latvia is the farthest from the EU. So it's uh, also, it's you have to, to go uh, very far uh, from Latvia to Germany, so you, it's, it's, it was a less, less intense border. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the interesting thing about this current uh, migration was that it, it was happening uh, in the airports in these states mostly, in, in these uh, cities, oh, sorry, cities, and mostly in Baghdad, Istanbul, but also a little bit uh, in, in Libya and in Liban, sorry, in Liban and the United Arab Emirates. And they usually they fly planes to Minsk and then cross from Minsk, take cars, rent cars and go to border and then cross on foot with borders. So the logic is, uh, it's, uh, it's like that. And uh, last uh, slide with some numbers, if you also to, to understand where people uh, coming from not only from airports but also from uh, uh, states. So Iraq is the majority of uh, of uh, people where, co where people are coming from. Also some some Afghanistan, Syria, uh, a little bit even from Russia, and even some from Belarus. It was, it was like that. So I 
I, I, I'm closing this, this, the slides as, uh, as you can see. I showed them like to, to have a, a context, uh, what kind of migration we are taking, what is taking place. And if we want to understand, the, if we want to understand the, why it started, of course we can go uh, quite a long history about Belarus, but uh, <laughs> which will, I will not do here. But uh, I will just uh, rem remind you that um, in 2020, last year, in 2020 August. Uh, Election happened. Presidential election happened in Belarus, which uh, were considered are, are still considered uh, illegitimate uh, because uh, it was declared that Lukashenko won as president. But it it was very huge uh, discrepancies in the calculations, and of course, uh, as you might have heard, uh, a lot of people went into the streets in August in 2020 and in uh, September and October, and uh, now. Protests, of course, has have been uh, repressed and uh, also not, not mostly uh, mostly silent protests. But uh, in, in the in the light of his protest, of course, uh, Lukashenko and his regime were using uh, a lot of force, a lot of force, and a lot of uh, threatening measures and punitive measures to stop people going out into the streets and also putting people in jails. So a, lot, a lot of political prisoners now are in Belarus. And because of that, uh, you, you actually, mostly EU put a lot of sanctions uh, against the Belarus. It's several rounds of um, sanctions, but put in mostly targeted sanctions, personal sanctions, or, or also sectoral sanctions. And uh, it seems like these sanctions worked uh, quite, not say well, but very well, but uh, it, it had an impact on the economic situation in Belarus and also irritated uh, President Luka, no, Lukashenko. And, uh, but it's like, it, it was like that. And uh, then uh, it came uh, May and, uh, and somehow in May, first uh, reports uh, be, uh, were made by our Lithuanian patrol, patrol, uh, border patrol service, that somehow number of uh, illegal crossings has, uh, has began, began to increase. And of course, if, if you, you keep in mind the uh, numbers in, for example, what happened in 2015 in the Mediterranean, of course, we are quite, uh, quite small, but percentage Percentage wise, uh, well, it, 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 some, somehow we seemed to uh, be important because in 2020 in Lithuania, in all whole year, 81 pe person, 81 people crossed uh, Lithuania and Belarus borders and, uh, illegally. But uh, till May 2021, already it was, in, it was already 90 people uh, crossing. So it was a huge increase, for example, uh, Five people in uh, in 2020 in that period were crossing uh, or caught crossing border illegally, so uh, it was already the first signs that something is happening. And also, patrol service said that it seems like Belarus border guards are starting to get some kind of unresponsive, uh, unresponsive, uh, slow in uh, reacting because it was usually the tradition that if you caught person, you just uh, co coordinate and communicate what to, uh, what to do with that person. So we started to not, not, not react. So the first signs were, were that, but then at the end of May, May 23rd, uh, this kind of famous, quite famous incident, uh, Ryan flight, Ryan Air flight incident happened when a flight from uh, flying from Athens to Vilnius was uh, uh, grounded in the Minsk. And uh, Roma, one of the opposition person was caught, uh, was taken uh, in that plane and also his partner. And after that, uh, another round of uh, outreach in, in, in Lithuania, of course, in all Europe started, and also another round of uh, sanctions started. And, uh, and it was, it happened uh, in, in that time, uh, in June, uh, Lukashenko, several, in, various, in various formats said that, okay, Belarus is suffering from sanctions. It doesn't have no money, so it can't deal with uh, drugs. It can't deal with uh, migration. Let it let Europe handle that because because we, we we can't anymore. So and if you want sanctions to us, you just deal with uh, with, with the cry with, uh, with with this problem. I'm paraphrasing, but in general, it was like at least once in uh, June and uh, beginning of July. So he said like that, and also uh, he and uh, his uh, officials have have been repeating something like that. that we don't have it's not our problem. Uh, and uh, in June and so. Actually, I, I would say that after the incident, Ryan, Ryan, uh, Ryan era flight incident, we can say that the uh, crisis is beginning to start. Migration you know, of border Belarus crisis has to be started. And I would say it's, it, 
of course, it's very difficult to, to, to like to analyze uh, the process when it's taking place. But I would say that now we can, at least till now, we can see like three different distinct stages of this, uh, uh, this problem. First, it was, and it's quite easily can divide two months, like June and July. In June and July, it was crisis at Lithuanian Polish border, uh, exceptional land, we can say. And uh, during June, some numbers started started of uh, people crossing the border illegally started to increase. It's like around we get around six hundred uh, people during June, and already in the and it's it's increases uh, the number increases rapidly. And already in uh, in like first or second of July, it is declared that we have uh, detained like detained people detained more than two thousand people. And it's actually a very huge number for Lithuania because it, it wasn't prepared to have all, to have already this number of people who, who, who are uh, crossing the border and are detained and put some, somewhere in uh, temporary camps, temporary facilities and so on. So, and actually in, in, in Lithuania, we, can, we start to feel in, in first days of July, uh, it's like political climate intensifies. Uh, our all governmental efforts from fighting pandemia are switched to, towards fighting <laughs> migration or fighting Belarus, whatever you can uh, you can uh, you can call. And very quickly, uh, in the Lithuania, Lithuanian foreign minister and those in the gov whole government starts to claim that uh, Belarus is fighting hybrid. It's it's, uh, may, it's uh, attacking. Uh, it's um, uh, Okay, this uh, situation was called hybrid attack or hybrid warfare. Uh, very, very, very quickly, just trying to stress, emphasize from the Finian side how important, how significant this problem was. And that, uh, of course, it's, it was done very consciously, and we can debate uh, how significant or necessary this concept is is needed but in the in the context of Lithuanian foreign policy and position of Lithuanian Lithuania like we, we consider this started very quickly to consider this crisis not like migration crisis but crisis Belarus be problem of Belarus but that's it's a question of dictator who is using people as um, weapons or means to his goal and we have to frame like this uh, and it was, it was, since then, we, you know, also Poland contributes now to, to this uh, rhetoric. But it's, it's not it's not about people actually. But it's more about fighting the dictator. Uh, and I think it's it, it, it's one of the first problematic signs what that was uh, that, that we could see in the context of thinking about uh, human rights of of migrants or refugees. Uh, because not many <laughs> refugees now uh, are considered refugees in Lithuania. Just we consider them just ask, asking for asylum. So that's one of, of the interesting points uh, we can uh, keep in mind. And of course, the variety of measures are taking place. Minister of Foreign Affairs goes uh, flies to Turkey and Iraq and Baghdad to ask for not not, not to fly these planes. But actually, it doesn't help. And uh, we get news that uh, Iraq air, airlines are going to increase flights, uh, more flights to Minsk, which is uh, which is very interesting because of, of course never before Minsk was considered a, a very interesting tourist route to to for Iraqi people. So it's pretty clearly what's what's the reason, and of course many variety of. Um, uh, news or uh, bits and pieces can start to emerge. How much it costs, uh, the, pro the process, how it takes. Like uh, we, people start to talk about between two thousand euros and twelve thousand euros uh, for the, these kind of services, and how uh, huge machine in Belarus is already working, inclu including officials, including uh, an official taxi people, and so on. And of course, uh, uh, and of course, uh, we, we should also remem rem uh, remember that uh, this kind of system is not only in Belarus. Of course, illegal smugglers, uh, like smugglers or people who are hel helping cross borders, uh, border in, in Lithuania and Poland, of course, are working in Lithuania and Poland and in Germany, and it's quite a huge um, network which is taking place. So the, the people which are, who are caught is not necessarily. That the num caught or counted, not, not not necessarily the number we can see, because um, at the now I read uh, like a week ago uh, number uh, official numbers by Germany. They said that this year uh, they got uh, ten thousand people from uh, from eastern border asking for refugee. It's also a huge number compared to the last last year. Like last year it was like two thousand. 
thousand. I will have I will have to check. So it's huge network and a huge problem. So and we have June and July. Uh, this kind of uh, people are crossing, and in uh, and the Lithuania is accepting them. Uh, if they are caught, we are accepting and they are, clo are closed in some camps and, and facilities. And during time also, debates are starting to emerge about uh, somehow finding new measures. And two measures were found, uh, which are very uh, also caught a lot of uh, discussions in Lithuania. One was uh, law on the uh, legal status of aliens or foreigners. I don't know how it's right to translate, was changed. Uh, and, uh, and actually it was... Uh, uh, well, Actually, it was law uh, diminishing human rights or reducing human rights of those who are asking for asylum. Uh, like you, you can close them for six months uh, and just uh, waiting for review of their applications, and uh, it's quite a long time. And actually, they still get, it's like information is uh, uh, limited to them, which they get, and so on and so on. So one one thing was done thus. Another another was uh, that decision was made in the very end of July to. We officially called to stop people crossing border, but what we call actually pushback strategy, like stop, like putting border guards to the border, and if somebody crosses the border, just push them back to Belarus border. And actually, in the numbers and if in terms of efficiency, it's, it totally worked. <laughs> it worked because Lithuania stopped accepting people, and just every everyone who's crossing is, is pushed back. And I'll just show last slide also quickly show one slide as you can see okay it's it's very clearly uh, yellow yellow uh, yellow columns are the number of people that are accepted and after August, when the decision was made, almost no people are accepted to Lithuania, and they all pushed, pushed, pushed back and just counted as, as a, 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 a attempts to cross the border. So it's, it's like that. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very visible that uh, for Lithuania it worked, and, but it also started second phase of, uh, oh, time flies, like second phase of uh, crisis, and now people started to move towards Poland. But Poland actually already was preparing for that because first signs, of course, was in July as well. And they were very, very quickly were decided to declare state of emergency in Poland. Since uh, 1st of September, Poland has a state of emergency three kilometers around his border with Belarus, which means, of course, again, uh, limiting, uh, limiting rights of population living there, also crossing there, also limiting rights of uh, journalists and NGO people to access the border and, and, uh, and this kind of effects we can see now in the media uh, were taking place in, in, in end of August, uh, beginning of July. And, and of course, we started immediately started, we even did, didn't start to accept people. In pushback strategy by Poland was used immediately when we started to feel that the number of people are, uh, is increasing. And uh, and then we have like autumn, September, October. This phase like pushbacks are working constantly. We get news, but uh, uh, for some time I, I, it it seems like uh, uh, Belarus side had to regroup. Or also uh, weather started to play a very huge role because uh, it got colder and colder and colder. So you, you can't keep people on the streets or in the forest for a very long time, of course. And uh, and now we have like last last phase in my eyes, like end of October and uh, November, when we have like huge crisis, <laughs> real crisis, because it's a real crisis in the terms that, um, that uh, European media started to talk about much much more, and it became much more visible, and much more international efforts uh, started to be used. And uh, it, now talking about positions, uh, as I see that time flies very 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 quickly. So as as I mentioned already in the, in the middle, that uh, Lithuania's position, how it treats this crisis, it's uh, but it's it's also Polish rhetoric that we these both states uh, are trying to emphasize that it's it's the it's not like normal migration crisis, for example, normal, you can say, and when, when it was happening in 2015 or some flows that uh, continue after that, but it's totally different and you have to deal different in, in different ways. It's like, it's not about dealing, for example, with Iraq or you know, Turkey, mostly, but dealing with, with the Belarus. 
of course, you, you, you know, European Union uh, tries uh, to uh, like balance uh, balances that view, and but it was pretty supportive or EU European Commission especially was pretty supportive uh, for Lithuania and for Poland like we support you we uh, we give some money to to deal with um, uh, with the crisis some surveillance equipment to some humanitarian means for that cross as well but but also we we are trying to keep the like different side for example European Commission uh, is totally against the the financing uh, Fence or border across uh, across uh, at, at, in the eastern part, which uh, both Lithuania, Latvia, and Poland are declaring that they vote this war and are asking for money. So the European Union tries to be more like softer on this on this question. But in general, now the biggest problem and biggest uh, expectation for everyone who is. Uh, 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 not, uh, observing this crisis, it's like well, now the new sanction sanctions uh, stage has to be okay, has to be accepted, and new step new pack new sanctions package uh, is awaited, and there are some discussions like maybe to sanction air air uh, fly air <laughs> Airlines, airlines for flying uh, people from uh, Syria, from uh, Iraq, and from Afghanistan, or, or do something else. So, because it, it seems like it's the only one way at the moment which is imagined how to stop this problem. But I, at the end, I have to say that nobody, nobody, for, I think, in Lithuania and Poland, and most probably the European Union institutions, expects that this problem will be uh, solved somehow quickly. Because now. According to different estimations, at least at least seven thousand people are in Belarus, which which of course they don't want to stay in. Uh, they want to get uh, to European Union, or or in Belarus also don't want, doesn't want them, so they have to get go somewhere. Uh, we don't, so and at the border, is a number of also changes at the Polish border. At, uh, there are some estimates that there are thousand and fifty five hundred people, so it's huge also number at the border. And at the border means we are building makeshift camps. We are making like temporary camps in the, in very cold weather, and very cold conditions. And it's like this humanitarian aspect is also huge, huge challenge. And I think one of the reasons why also Germany got uh, very, a lot of involved in, in, that, in this problem. So that's the current situation. And I will stop because I could talk a little bit more, but I don't, don't want you to take your time. So if you have some questions or comments, please. So I have to uh, I have a question in the, in the chat. So one is is Lukashenko using migrants to engage in the so-called hybrid war between European uh, Union member states? Uh, I feel like it's a question more about what, what Lukashenko wants, and of course nobody knows. But we can like two dominant interpretations uh, I, I find here. Usually it's like one is like revenge, revenge for because like there is a, there is a good tool to to make a revenge. And another, uh, another most it's revenge is like not not you can take very seriously, but it, it may be important. But another more significant, I guess, it's one of the way to force European Union to talk uh, with Belarus, because uh, till uh, last week when Merkel talked with Lukashenko, no official uh, political or official from European Union or member or EU member state didn't uh, hasn't talked to Lukashenko and it's not he has not acknowledged as legitimate head of Belarus. So in some sense he got his way a little bit. He, and uh, some people say that uh, migration crisis, migration border crisis of Belarus, of course, uh, puts uh, puts uh, member states among themselves a little quarrel and uh, and creates tension among, among us, which is also in uh, Belarus eyes is a good uh, way. Second, I, I'm not just taken to repatriate uh, uh, people which are. Uh, taking uh, taking their countries, I measure, uh, yes, and uh, actually actually uh, during the last two weeks, uh, I'm I'm seeing appro appro approximately at least three flights to Iraq back to Iraq where it took place in in, in Lithuania, and the numbers are still co coming like our exact numbers are still coming coming, but uh, at least uh, three like. Uh, 
more than 500, I would say, uh, conservatively, people are flying back. But uh, so, so there are some measures, of course, uh, but it's very slow. Not many people want to go. Uh, Besides, we usually you have to wait for temporary documents from Iraq and also take slow place. But they have to say that Lithuania declared that uh, it will give 300 euros per person if they are coming back to their home countries, which is uh, one of the also the interesting uh, measures it will, it will take place. For, and, and about human rights and about if there are any measures taken to protect uh, minors. Actually, I'm not sure about Poland, but in Lithuania, it was push. Uh, we have also a child ombudsman, child rights ombudsman, who she's working very hardly to persuade government, like to get help, was working to get access and to to put people, families of small children, to put in more bet, in better conditions. Uh, and there are some efforts. I wouldn't say. Uh, I, I say it's very slow, and it's it, our government accepts that you have to treat humanely some people, but it's it's very slow, and um, and um, and for me, and actually for a long time, uh, it was very difficult to access not only border border region of Lithuania for human rights organizations and uh, journalists, but also with facilities where people are kept. So it was a huge challenge. A lot of pushback now our government is receiving and it's all opening, but, but it's very slow. I think you, you saw it, you can't today or yesterday, Human Rights Watch declared that, for example, both Poland and Belarus are responsible for, all, for human rights violation at the border. So it's, it's a huge challenge. And uh, it's, that's all three questions from the chat. And uh... maybe I ask one more question. Um, maybe I misunderstood. I'm not quite sure. It, who is getting 300 euro, and what happens then? Uh, people, uh, our government, uh, Lithuanian government said that uh, if you agree, or if you are like uh, not asking for refugee uh, asylum status for refugee status, uh, but if you agree to come back to your home country. Uh, you get 300 euros, like for travel expense. What well, you can say for travel expenses or for for something like that. So our government pays. Pay, pay. I don't know how it works actually, process in process wise and detail wise, but uh, it, it's like official policy and it wasn't. Uh, uh, it, it is. It is in in in, in work. It's it's act, active policy. So, okay, so they have to seek for asylum in Lithuania, no, no. and then they get yeah. 300 euros. And they. they no, no, it's secret, not sick, but we are coming like, okay, we're asking for if you, for asylum status, but then we say, okay, no, we don't want to stay here. We want to come back to our home country. And okay. if, when they get the documents, then also I pay, pay like um, pocket money. Yeah? If you say that 300 money, 300 euros are pocket money for each person gets this money. So it's, uh, it's one of the way uh, to say like per persuasion tactics. I don't know if it's it, how much it's it's one of the factors to persuade people to leave. I think more more factor is like that we are stuck here here in, in Lithuania and uh, bad conditions and no future. Uh, so I think we are agreeing because of that, but we got money. Okay, and maybe um, one last question since um, um, pushbacks are actually illegal and illegal measure in Europe, and also it doesn't help because people are kind of trapped as I understood because they can't go they are pushed back from Lithuania from Poland but they can't go back to um, Belarus as well so what actually what do you think in your opinion what would be the role of the European Union also when winter time comes up and so on and so forth to actually help and support without breaking the law so to say that's question <laughs> a tough question yeah, yeah, I know. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> I think the European Union uh, in, uh, Commission, European Commission, at the end of uh, July, implicitly kind of allowed to, to make to use the strategy. No, no, of course, we will not say it uh, officially because immediately after a visit of uh, Commissioner of uh, in, for Internal Affairs, sorry, I don't remember her name. Uh, this, this this strategy was declared as uh, uh, so so one. Uh, my assumption is that it was implicit. Somehow we said, okay, we make, we clo will close eyes for some time. And because of the terrible photos and his stories uh, that started to appear, uh, European Union started to react a little bit differently. 
I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> Now it's actually it's, now it's the time when everyone is looking for uh, for ways out because I think nobody wants to push very strongly uh, Lithuania and either Poland to stop this pushback strategy. We, we criticizing, of course, in the, especially human rights organizations, but uh, nobody but but nobody wants to say accept uh, and actually. It's, it's, it's very important to understand that Lithuania and Poland are very conservative countries in the sense people are uh, not used to mig migrants, which are different. They are used to Belarus people, but not used to different people who are coming from uh, farther countries. And it's a political crisis inside. It, might be, it was political crisis inside. And uh, that's the reason that our government is like prepared to violate human rights of um, migrants because it wants to stay in power, let's say like that. It's not, not the answer to your question, I know. Thank you. So again, it's the human rights organizations or the non-governmental organizations that we have to support in order to yes. make a change and raise awareness, actually. Yes, well, I okay. think so. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think there's a lot more we can talk about this, but um, I guess we have to get on to our next presentation. So thanks a lot uh, for coming here and to shed some light on the situation. Um, then I would hand over to Fiona. Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, I just very, very briefly want to introduce, present two of my colleagues, um, Claudia Padovani and Francesca Helm, who very kindly offered to come to talk to us about the network Scholars at Risk. Uh, now, uh, Claudia and Francesca work in the political sciences department at the University of Padova, but um, they have, as well as their regular work, they devote a great amount of time and energy to Scholars at Risk. Um, scholars at Risk, uh, Padova has become part of, our university has become part of the uh, network thanks to their work and they're very active on a local level, a national level and an international level. And today we're going to learn more about the work of Scholars at Risk and uh, its um, fight for academic freedom from offering sanctuary to Scholars at Risk to uh, the work of advocacy, which uh, both Claudia and Francesca have been um, making a lot of effort to promote within our university. So thank you very much for coming. Um, and would you like to... Thank you, Fiona. Yes, shall I yes. share the screen? Yes. Yep. Um, sorry. Is it in presentation mode? No, it's being very slow. Okay, uh, thank you very much for inviting us. It's a pleasure to be here with the um, ARCUS um, members and particular this group. Um, we're looking forward to discussing possible ways of collaborating together. So a, little, a few words about the uh, Scholars at Risk Network. It's actually an international network which launch, was launched um, in the United States in 99. Well, 2000 was the official launch at the University of Chicago. And since then, many universities have joined, as you can see. Um, currently, there are over 500 universities um, in many parts of the world. Actually, um, there are 218 there were a couple of years ago partners in Europe. So Europe has a very strong um, presence in the SAR network. Um, SAR also has national sections. So um, Italy has a national section, which was created in, in 2009. And Claudia will talk a little bit more about that. There are also sections in, in Switzerland and various other countries in Europe. And I know some of the ARCUS uh, member universities are also members of Scholars at Risk. Um, so Scholars at Risk works with an inclusive um, and articulate understanding of academic freedom is, and um, it has become an issue that increasingly important in the European context. Um, here we have the UNESCO definition um, of academic freedom. So the right without constriction by prescribed doctrine to freedom of teaching and discussion freedom in carrying out research and disseminating and publishing the results thereof, 
freedom to express freely their opinion about the institution or system in which they work, freedom from institutional censorship, and freedom to participate in professional or representative academic bodies. So the, the work of the Scholars at Risk Network comes under three main um, pillars or areas, um, which we will, be we will describe later on in terms of the Italian section. So it, there is protection, which is hosted through, um, by engaging universities, offering scientific positions for research and scholars from countries and from different disciplines who are in difficulty. There is advocacy, which entails monitoring research and awareness raising around human rights and academic freedom with students, university staff, and volunteer researchers. Um, we also organize student advocacy days, which we will talk about. And it's also about learning. We have learning about um, the promotion of core higher education values. I think it's important to highlight academic freedom is one of core higher education values, which it's important to promote. Learning also about SAR scholars, the situations in their countries through activities such as speaker series um, with invited talks, um, SAR has created a MOOC um, and all sorts of other activities in the realm of learning. So I'll pass on to Claudia, who will talk about the um, Italian SAR section. Thanks, Francesca. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Fiona, also for the introduction. And thanks to the first speaker for uh, providing such a, an excellent and uh, uh, warring um, view of what's going on at the Belarus border, uh, which, of course, we as uh, SAR Italy have been dealing with uh, since uh, uh, mid-2020. As a, as a national section, of course, uh, follows uh, many of the situations um, that happen around the world. Uh, here, what you see is uh, the list of uh, logos from the different universities that are part of this uh, Italian network. We uh, started as a network in February 2019, so it was uh, quite uh, not long ago. But in the course of these uh, less than three years, uh, we've grown from uh, 14 universities uh, to 30 universities uh, now participating in the network. And the structure is quite simple as we have uh, a coordinating group of which Francesca and I are part of uh, uh, together with Esther Gallo from the University of Trento. Then we have a steering committee that comprises uh, seven of the member universities. Uh, and then there is the assembly. And we try to meet regularly, either in person when possible or uh, online. Uh, next slide, please. And um, so we basically work uh, in um, close collaboration with SAR International, but also with a certain degree of autonomy. Uh, and yet we work on the same three pillars. Uh, so here uh, we are uh, just suggesting some of the activities that have been conducted at the national level uh, in the three areas that Francesca uh, previously described. So as far as protection, of course, uh, there's lots of concern on how to carry out hosting uh, activities uh, to provide uh, safe haven and sanctuaries uh, for scholars uh, and researchers. Uh, uh, in their different uh, uh, stages of seniority. So in some cases, these may be established scholars, in other cases, these are younger scholars. So of course, uh, and in some cases, uh, they are individuals, uh, um, otherwise they may have families. So how to host uh, is a major concern uh, and it needs to be addressed at very different levels. Uh, so some of this is the legal and institutional aspects. Uh, and this is why it's so important to collaborate uh, with the institutional and the central offices, administrative offices of the universities. And part of the hosting is, of course, uh, mentoring and accompanying the hosted scholar uh, through all sorts of um, challenges uh, that relate their integration in the department, uh, uh, networking with the broader uh, scientific community. So in that respect, uh, something that we found very useful was not only to host the seminars uh, whereby we discuss some of the challenges, but also to produce uh, a, a guide for hosting that is kind of a translation of the SAR International Guide, but very much targeted at the Italian context, uh, which is now available. It's of course in Italian, 
but it may be interesting uh, also to share uh, with the network. And then uh, we, we map uh, and, uh, and follow very closely what goes on in the different universities that are hosting different scholars. Uh, and last year there were seven scholars hosted at five different institutions. Then the second aspect uh, is actually what Francesca was showing is learning. Uh, the learning has different uh, dimensions. Uh, so there is an ongoing speaker series, uh, which is organized uh, um, as uh, SAR Italy. We do have uh, a working group uh, that works uh, basically to organize the calendar for this. In many cases, this is about providing the hosted scholar the possibility to present uh, not only their situation as at-risk scholars, but also their scientific work. And this has proven to be very relevant. Um, in 2020, we managed to organize the European Researchers Night uh, with a kind of a, an event that was moving across the different universities, but of course it was uh, everything from remote. And yet this idea of networking within the country and also outside the country is very relevant. Uh, and we also organize uh, thematic web webinars uh, on different aspects, uh, specific situations. So we did have organized something on Belarus, uh, Actually, last year in October, uh, we've been organizing on Egypt, we've been organizing on different other countries. Uh, um, and of course, uh, there's a possibility for students to get involved uh, also with the activities that the universities uh, are carrying out. We are currently in the process of organizing an international conference uh, in the, at the University of Padova, which is going to be part of the celebration for the 800 years to take place in June next year. And so, of course, the Arcus Alliance uh, will be uh, advise uh, and you will know when this is taking place uh, and of course you're more than welcome to come and participate and then the last aspect that we work on is advocacy so the next slide please um, as you see highlighted in red are some of the elements that we see may be the focus of a conversation about possible collaboration within uh, uh, the Arcus Alliance so as far as the advocacy, we follow closely what goes on at the international level as uh, SAR Europe uh, has uh, established a coordinating committee on these issues to deal with the European institution, to deal with the national institution. But beside that, there are lots of things happening within the universities. And in particular, uh, both University of Padova and Trento have been organizing over the last years, uh, some students advocacy seminars, uh, which have proven to be amazing learning opportunities. Francesca will say something more about this, just to give a very concrete example of how each and every one of these activities uh, actually implies uh, lots of thinking, of planning, collaboration, outreach, networking, uh, but many of these initiatives are actually liaise, uh, are linked uh, to uh, activities, similar activities that happen in other uh, countries. Uh, and so we have different collaborations uh, um, and we've been working on very specific uh, cases uh, a very well-known one is, of course, that of Patrick Zaki, Egyptian student at the University of Bologna. Uh, also, probably very, very well-known is that of Dr. Ahmadreza Jalali, Iranian scholar. Maybe less known to the general public is that of Nilu Farbayani, also from Iran. On all these cases, uh, students have been working to develop advocacy campaign, uh, increase their own knowledge, write reports, uh, which are then relevant also to SAR International. So we see that there is an ongoing link with them also. Next slide. So the, 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 the invitation is broad. Uh, this is the usual invitation that SAR gives uh, to interested uh, institutions, both university and research centers, um, not only to join the SAR network, but also to carry out some of the activities that uh, SAR uh, is doing. Uh, certainly with the idea that the entire university community should be part of this effort uh, from the administration uh, to the uh, scientific staff uh, and of course uh, also students. And that's why we would like to, to focus and um, uh, discuss a bit further the student seminar. But just because we are in the Arcus context, uh, I think it's, it's relevant for us uh, to know and share also um, some of the some of the Arcus members are part of the Scholars at Risk Network. And to our understanding, universities of Bergen, of Graz and Vilnius are all part of SAR. In some cases, this is more kind of a support to the organization. In other cases, uh, there have been experiences of hosting. So it will be very interesting to know if Arcus uh, participants are also aware of this. And in some cases we realize that 
the same people are actually acting on different uh, uh, on the different uh, roles. Uh, we also know that some other Arcus universities uh, uh, have not uh, joined SARS or not part of the of the network. Uh, but like in the case of Leipzig, uh, we're told uh, that uh, Leipzig has an experience of hosting scholars. So of course, all these are lessons that have been learned and should be circulated farther. Francesca. By the way, so, yes. So, in in terms of advocacy, the events, I, um, SAR publishes a free to think report every year with um, information on um, situations in various countries. And I think I'd like to point out that on the 9th of December there will be the um, an online semi, an, an online webinar organised by SAR International where they actually launch this free to think report. And that's one opportunity for universities to really um, learn more about the work of SAR and obviously the situation in Belarus um, will be featuring in the report. So SAR encourages all universities to, to organize events around this, um, which is one possibility. We also have some images from the campaigns that we've been involved with, um, advocacy campaigns regarding Dr. Ahmad Reza Jalali in particular and also Patrick Zaki. But I wanted to say a few words about the student advocacy seminars, because um, this is something that we've been doing two years um, at the University of Padova. Um, unfortunately, given the, the COVID situation, these have been online, but the photograph you can see in the middle is our very kind of joyous um, first time we actually met with the students on an, a student advocacy day, which we organized in um, June this year also involving the student union. So we had students involved in the seminar, but also the one of the student unions in the city, which we think was a very important aspect of it. The, 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 the laboratorio of um, student advocacy seminar is actually a credit uh, bearing optional courses and elect students can take part in, in students from the course in European and global studies. Um, and what happens is that students work on the specific cases of scholars, um, and the scholars we've been working on the two years were, as Claudia mentioned before, Ahmed Reza Jalali and Nilufar Bayani from Iran. And this year we also worked on the case of Patrick Zaki, an Italian student. Um, and the advocacy seminar, I'd just like to point out that we also have international students working on the seminars. And this has also raised our awareness of the issue of protecting the international students we have. We have students from Iran, we have students from Egypt this year. And for them to be working on advocacy seminars is important for them, but it's also important for us to protect, protect their status coming from um, countries where they may be at risk, as the, Pat, as the case of Patrick Zaki highlighted. Um, and the goals of the learning in the student seminars are, um, because it's a very experiential approach to learning, the, the students do human rights research, they learn about standards and mechanisms, um, also engage with international relations and the issue of academic freedom, um, transversal skills, we have leadership and teamwork as in small groups, they have to develop their campaigns. Um, they also have to network with student advocacy seminars in other countries which are taking place. So they're acquiring um, intercultural competences, both within their groups and through the international networking. They have to organize a campaign and network for advocacy. Um, learn to write and speak publicly, and also engage in social media and online campaigning. And so as you can see from the goals of experiential learning, it's also an activity which is very well suited to networks, for example, such as the Arcus Network. It's a very networked um, activity. Um, and we also collaborate in the seminars, not only with other universities doing um, advocacy campaigns on the same scholars, but also with organizations on national, international and local levels. So, for example, we've worked with Amnesty International Padova, um, but also Amnesty International, the Central Office in Rome. We've worked with Wikimedia because students have been working on Wikipedia pages about the scholars at risk. And then these others you can see here are university bubble in the States, but also in, in the UK who have been doing um, advocacy seminars at the same time. And then, because we know that we will have the opportunity to meet uh, uh, in breakout rooms uh, later on, there are a couple of these of uh, questions uh, that Francesca and I have thought about in consideration of the fact that something we did not mention so clearly is that uh, all of this uh, 
um, happens uh, through basically collaboration. So there are collaboration at the international level. For instance, uh, we are currently in, in, a, in a close collaboration with the Swedish SAR section. So we are organizing workshops, uh, we're organizing advocacy campaigns together. There are collaboration at the national level. So we've been in conversation with the Italian Conference of Rectors. Uh, we're currently approaching the Ministry of Universities, so more institutional and also collaboration, for instance, with UNHCR in Italy on, on different issues. And then, of course, there are collaboration within the network. So our questions really relate to how we see uh, the possibility for ARCOS to be one of these spaces whereby the, collabor the collaboration can be productive and take us uh, farther. And of course, that can happen at very different levels uh, from uh, the basic uh, aspect of sharing experiences, uh, to maybe engaging in some of the joint uh, activities uh, and possibly also thinking in longer term uh, what could be one of the more uh, politically relevant outcomes uh, of, uh, of ARCUS uh, as an alliance uh, to maybe uh, promote uh, and support academic freedom through a series of practices. And so the questions uh, that we will be addressing in the breakout rooms uh, are uh, uh, what conditions in your universities and departments uh, are there to support academic freedom in practice, starting from some of the examples that we have provided, and also what you see in the bigger picture, the role of ARCOS in promoting academic freedom in both theory and practice. So reflecting on the concept itself and then translating the concept into reality. Thank you so much. I noticed that there is a question in the, in the chat, but maybe this is one of the issues that we can address uh, uh, later on in the working group, not to take too much space from other speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia and Francesca, for that really clear uh, presentation that's given us a lot of food for thought. And I think, um, We'll move on now, but yes, we'll come back to the questions in our breakout rooms and um, um, include your two questions as part of the breakout room discussion later on. Thank you very much again. I will now, uh, we'll now go back to Tomar, who I think is going to present herself. Yes, uh, <laughs> I may present myself and uh, let me share my screen and... Uh... Do you see my presentation? I guess you do. Not in that, wait. Can you see the presentation? Yeah. 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 Okay, yes, thank we you. can come out, we can see perfectly. Okay. Great, uh, so, uh, sorry. Um, we will be coming to Belarus question and, and the topic of Belarus. Uh, as we talked in the first part of the webinar that uh, about the migrant crisis and, and what is happening at the borders. Uh, so this presentation will be linked to support programs offered by Vilnius University to students from Belarus. Uh, and uh, it is also can be seen as a reflection of what is happening at the border. It, it affects the border situation, I guess, a little bit and the border situation affects the support program. So uh, uh, I will talk about that. Uh, in, in my presentation. So uh, yeah, uh, this initiative of Vilnius University started as a way to express solidarity with people of Belarus and support the democratic aspirations of the citizens in, in the neighboring country. We can all agree that uh, stability in the region and the neighboring countries is very important. And, and uh, we also, as, as countries uh, of European Union see, see the need to, support the neighboring countries, support people who are in the path of democracy, let's, we can call it like that. And, and this is how this uh, support program and the scholarship started. And the idea, the main idea behind this is to provide an opportunity for young people and motivated people from Belarus to become Vilnius University students and continue the tradition of the nations and cultures that was formed by the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. So there is a historical meaning to the scholarship and, and, and to that idea. And to quote our rector, Professor Remedas Patrauskas, the history of, of the university is, is very closely related to the formation of the Belarusian nation. And, and there are a lot of um, connections between uh, both countries, both nations, and, and the Belarusian signs are 
the cultural signs are, are seen in Vilnius and, and the university, the language, the culture, everything is very connected. And it's not only the border, but the common and similar history and, and the past of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. So it was thought to be a good reason to, to call the scholarship like that, to, to have this temporary uh, contemporary link to the nowadays situation and, and uh, both societies and both countries. Uh, so, yeah, the scholarship was established in August 2020 as a response, as a reaction to what was happening in Belarus after the, the election. There were protests, there were people who were trying to express their opinions but were not allowed to do so. So uh, this scholarship uh, started as a, as a way to support them. And it was awarded uh, to the most gifted applicants from Belarus as well as the students who were uh, who have been victims of the repressions of the regime and wanted to transfer their studies to Vilnius University. So we offered a monthly grant of 200, 300 euros to cover living expenses. Uh, we offered tuition fee waivers, uh, state funded places, and, and the idea was to help them and, and give them a chance to study free of charge and also have this financial support in, in the beginning of their studies. Uh, there were no uh, specific requirements for, for the applicants. All applicants from Belarus who fulfilled the academic requirements to be accepted uh, to the programs were eligible to apply for the scholarship. So there was no uh, very specific or strict requirements. And it is also important to understand that at that time, um, students were not uh, and young people were not allowed to express their opinions. And, and the situation was very intense in, in, in Belarus. And uh, those who actively participated in the protests or, or expressed their opinions or were the part, uh, the, were the members of the democratic movement, uh, were followed, were uh, repressed or even arrested. They were expelled from universities. Their families were um, followed or, or, or uh, and, and a lot of different things and a lot of cases were very individual and, and different so Vilnius University offered the full full-time studies to begin from the from the beginning from the first course but we also um, uh, accepted the uh, transfers uh, of students who couldn't graduate in Belarus for example and wanted to finish their studies at Vilnius University and and, and so on so uh, in order to start the process and and everything uh, we uh, started fundraising campaign to support Belarusian students and scientists persecuted by Lukashenko's regime. We started a, uh, an information campaign and uh, this part is also difficult, but because it's not so easy to share the information if the information flow is being controlled. So we used opposition channels to, to transfer our message, to transfer the information about the opportunity to receive the scholarship, to receive uh, a, a state funded places or, or the other grants. So, uh, and, and we got a quite uh, high reach because during the first days of the messages in, in the opposition channels, thousands, uh, ten thousands of Belarusians uh, read it, reacted, uh, contacted us, asked about the application process and, and, and so on. So going to the specific numbers, we received around 500 applications in 2020 from, from applicants from Belarus. And it's also uh, important to, to mention that uh, we start our studies from September uh, usually, uh, but uh, with this campaign, with this uh, reaction, we, we, we started in, in August. We had to postpone everything with Belarusians and, and the, the period was really intense. We, we had a lot of applications, a lot of qualifications and each case was individual. So, uh, and, and as a result, we accepted 90 students, around 90 students uh, and 25 of them received the Grand Duchy of Lithuania scholarship. 56 bachelor students received the state funded places. Uh, 34 master students received tuition fee waivers from Vilnius University. We do not have free education uh, in, in, in Lithuania, so, so we are looking for waivers for, for the state funded places and, and, and so on, on how to cover uh, tuition fees for the students. So um, it, it was not only the scholarships that, that helped uh, 
uh, as I said, uh, each case was individual and each applicant was, was different. So some of them uh, didn't have the required English proficiency level. So we offered the intensive language courses free of charge for them. We also offered all the student services, counselings and, and, and support mechanisms. Uh, and also uh, additional documents, uh, which was um, more important this year. Last year, we didn't have this problem, but for, for, for example, this year, uh, due to the intense situation between uh, Lithuania and uh, Belarus, due to the fact of migration, migrant crisis, there were problems with visa issuing, uh, not all the, not, embassy was not working properly due to those intense, um, not conflicts, but in, in intense situations. Uh, so students were not able to cross the border in some cases, even though they had like a legal student visa and the reason to come to Lithuania. And there were such situations this year when the student calls uh, to the admissions office, is standing at the border and is not able to cross because doesn't have a document in Russian or Belarusian, for example. So uh, we couldn't plan everything. We couldn't... Uh, have a plan for, for the whole uh, admissions process, but we reacted uh, naturally on the way. So we prepared additional documents, uh, something in Russian, just to help them cross the border and come to Lithuania. Um, so this program is, is now uh, have on, on its second year, we'll start the third. And uh, the scholarship was expanded a little, a little, and it is now awarded to students from Belarus and, and Ukraine. Having in mind the historical context and the idea of the scholarship, uh, it was meaningful. So, so now both applicants from Belarus and Ukraine can apply for the scholarship and receive it. Also, what changed is that we had less applications uh, from Belarus due to the various restrictions this year, because it is, um, it is more difficult to reach them uh, because of the information flow control and um, because of the regime and, and, and everything and the intense situation at the border and with visas and everything. So it, it, it is last year we, we had more applicants, we had more students this year, uh, it, it, it has changed a little bit. But still we awarded 25 students with uh, scholarships and also 26 bachelor students received state funded places uh, also we were we had some transfers and 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 uh, some of the faculties granted tuition fee waivers for master students so we're still working with what we have uh, but but still trying to support uh, every student who who may need the support uh, so yeah, for, to sum up, uh, I think I will save some uh, save us some time <laughs> with my presentation um, about the future perspectives. Uh, Vilnius University will continue providing financial support and uh, academic support for students from Belarus, and and uh, the main goal still is the same: to support academic community, to support academic freedom, and and give them opportunity to to feel free and safe while studying at Vilnius, for example, at Lith in Lithuania, and, and maybe after receiving a, a good education, coming back to their countries and, and trying to change things and, and uh, being the beginning of, the, the, of something better uh, in, in the path of the democracy. And uh, yeah, Lithuanian government is also very involved in, in the whole process with various programs, with various support mechanisms. And uh, other universities in Lithuania also are creating their own scholarships, their own programs in order to support the, the students. So um, I didn't mention it before, but, but uh, the, the point of this presentation uh, uh, and talking about the, of this case was, was to present a local point of view. It, it may, may not be um, uh, done with all the countries, but, but in some cases, in, in some regions, in, in, in local situations, there are chances to react in, in, in some ways and create a positive change. So uh, I guess that's it for, for me. And uh, yeah, I don't know if you have any questions, we can uh, talk about that in the breakout rooms as well.
I think if uh, thank you, Toma. I think if there's one or two questions, because you didn't use up all your time, you yeah, I, I still have time. So <laughs> to ask something, which is a good thing. Um, I can see Helen who is raising her hand. Yeah, thank you, Toma. Um, could you just outline the time frame again from the happening of the events, the fundraise campaign, and the first uh, awarding of the or the awarding of the first scholarship? Maybe I didn't get it, but. Yeah, so we, it all started from August last year and, and the scholarships were awarded to those who were accepted. So we accept students, uh, they, they, they received scholarships from the beginning of their studies. So those who, uh, the, the program started last year, but only those who started their study, wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> they started their studies from October and they received the scholarship then. So once they started studying, they received the grants and the state funded places and everything. And those who applied this year, they received the, the scholarships from September for the whole year, for the first year. And, and how long did, did it take to, to, um, to publish the, or the call of the fundraising and to finally pay or the, the scholarships? I'm just wondering how, how much time does it take to organize such a um, such fundraising? It, it happened really quickly, actually. Fundraising was a part, one part of, of, of the... Um, we also raised, but we also had, uh, we had this foundation of Phoenix University, which used the money to, to support the students. Uh, so, uh, yeah, those who started from October, they received the, the scholarships right away. So it, it was a quite a quick process with everything and, and with information campaign and, and uh, scholarships. I, I would not, I'm not able to go very into details uh, because uh, I was not responsible for, for the scholarships and the, form, and the collecting of, of the funds and everything, but uh, I could dig deeper into that and... and <laughs> give you an answer later. Maybe in addition to that, Benedetta put a question in the in the chat about the selection process. I'm not sure if you were part of this, how to select the students, like what are the criteria? Yeah, we, uh, we, all the applicants have motivational interviews with the faculties. So after the interviews, we ask the faculties to give us a list of students who under their mind could receive the scholarship. So that's the one. Uh, as for the bachelor students and state funded places, so all applicants from Belarus received state funded places. So there was no uh, other criteria, just being an applicant and, and we had an, an enough places to, to cover their, their tuition fees. As for the scholarship, yeah, we evaluate their motivational interviews um, if they have additional information about their background and, and the problems they, they had in, in Belarus, that also works as a reason to, to give support. But, but yeah, there are no very specific requirements for that. Because there are no, not many applicants. So if we had thousands of applicants, of course, there should be uh, more requirements maybe. But right now we can uh, support most of the students. Thank you. I think it's a very important point to have the selection process, especially for persons mm -hmm. at risk in mind. Like, how do you yeah, select? Yeah, of course. But, uh, but as I said, it's only two years and, and we're still developing the processes and, and everything. Uh, it, it may change and, and will be more focused on scholars at risk in, in that way, not, an, not as much as in a gifted applicants. Yeah, if you know what I mean. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's so. exactly an important point, I think. That we yeah. have to stress out also when we talk about programs. This is not yeah, a gifted course. student program, it's no, a no. program for persons at risk. So we have to keep that in mind, I think. Yeah. Thank you so much, Toma. <laughs> it was very interesting. Thank you. So um, we have been in Southern Europe and talking about programs, and we have been in Eastern Europe, and now we move on to go to um, Leipzig because we also have um, a program for persons at risk. And uh, I would like to introduce Johannes Gepper who is a PhD student and an assistant to Professor Carmen Bachmann. Um, and they are both working at the Department for Business Taxation uh, here at Leipzig University. 
And in 2015, when a lot of persons were coming to seek for asylum, especially from, from Syria, I think Professor Bachmann um, built up a, um, a platform uh, in, to have a possibility for, for scientists, for researchers and for students who fled their country to get in touch with people, with local peers. And Johannes was part of the whole process as well, as I understood. And he's still uh, working with the program and with the platform. And uh, it's your turn now to present uh, uh, your project. Thank you very much. Um, let's share the screen first. I hope you can see everything. Yes. Great. So I'm delighted to present you to you the uh, our initiative Chance for Science, and I thank Stephanie for the introduction and the invitation. Um, I'm very happy to get the ability to show our project in this determined circle. And I just jumped out of a lecture, so um, I just came into the office, um, but we will manage it somehow. <clears throat> Um, our first motivation to found Chance for Science, um, as you said, Kam Bachmann, my professor and doctoral mother, <laughs> um, initiated this in 2015, was that back then we had the situation that thousands of people were sitting in improvised refugee camps and they had nothing to do. And Kam wanted to support those of them who came with an ac academic background and she wanted to enable access to knowledge by bringing them into libraries, into contact with colleagues inside the universities again. Our plan was as follows. Um, Kam one day in 2015 asked me, a student for information systems in the third bachelor semester who just started as student assistant at her chair, if I could program a website like Facebook to connect flat scientists to German professors. At least I would be a computer scientist. In private, I was not able, but firstly, I liked her idea, and secondly, I realized that if I admit my uncertainty, this could have been the last days as a student assistant. And so we started. We used a template from a dating website and restructured everything. For example, we had to swap heart icons into doctoral caps, which we found was more professional and very trend setting, as we can see today. After, this, after the website was online, we thought our job was done and we mail in back and wait for registrations. Although the German press liked the topic and initiative, the information did not went through into the refugee camps. After a few days, we had over 120 German professors who signed up but no refugees to connect them. We were overwhelmed by the encouragement of German academics who showed their willingness to help. So Kam started to visit the camps in Leipzig directly and search for academics and she found them. Um, today we count 798 users on the platform, 297 are refugees. The traffic is constant and we hope that Chance for Science still helps to get into contact with peers who are interested in the same topics and can help. Even the international press reported about Chance for Science. Um, NPR Radio, for example, came to Leipzig, um, The Guardian and The Science printed our story. Today, we intend to bridge the gap between initiatives that offer support for refugees and the refugees themselves. Chance for Science is a mediating institution to bridge this information gap. And Chance for Science is an agile and fast acting organization which is not integrated in, into a big institution, but receives support from Leipzig University. Our target groups are, as I said, um, German research institutions. It is made for refugee and local academics. Academics are people that studied, um, but not working in, in, in science today. Um, for example, doctors or engineers, and of course, for local and uh, flat students. This is our website. Currently, it's available in German and English, and we try to keep the registration process as simple as possible. You can choose your status as refugee or local scientist. It is also optimized for mobile, mobile access. Um, you can indicate where you are located, and the website will search for the nearest colleague, which might match your personal academic background. Based on this information, um, each user creates his or her own profile. That is what you all know from uh, Facebook, for example, and other users will be able to read this information. However, each user decides which information will be available to other users. A search function enables filtering by location, status, academic, flat uh, field, and allows to specify um, your search. There's a built-in messaging service um, that allows to contact each other directly and anonymously. 
again, each user can decide which information he wants to share. And we try to strike the fear of the first contact by creating the system where only the self-chosen username appears. And in a later step, after both sides feel comfortable with the new contact, it is possible to swap the real contact data. And that is the point where our users leave the website and go their own way. Um, enabling the context was the first step, but we figured out that further measures are necessary. For example, support to overcome cultural differences and support the orientation in the German scientific landscape, which is very often not similar to um, the systems where our users come from. In 2017, we organized and hosted a big scientific conference here in Leipzig, where we did not want to talk about refugees, but we wanted to let them talk for themselves. And the aim was to promote the perception as scientists, not as refugee. And we offered workshops together with other partners, for example, the Job Center, to give information about scientific landscape and how applications for jobs work, how to write a CV, which funding opportunities exist, and so on. One word to our conference, Academics on the Flight. Um, as I said, we didn't want to talk about refugees, what was very common at this time in German television, for example. But um, we want to show about their knowledge in short presentation and poster presentations. I brought some impressions from this conference. For example, we talked about topics, um, how can laurels be used for medical purposes? Um, how can Aleppo be rebuilt by the society? And how can coronary heart diseases be measured? So very right, uh, very right topic. This is uh, calm on the left, <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, what do we do today? Um, firstly, we keep the website running, of course, and there are several adaptions uh, needed um, as the refugee environment keeps changing. This morning, you already talked about the situation at the Belarusian border. This might also lead to changes in our website and um, to enable the service to new people with different needs. And secondly, we use our know-how from the workshops to produce information videos on the topics, academic environment, career development, and teaching and research. Please feel free to go through it via our website. Um, the spoken language is English and there are subtitles in German, Turkish, and Arabic. And what is very new, um, thanks to the DAD and the International Center of Leipzig, um, Helen and Stephanie, we just started to produce videos for new students coming to Leipzig. And we try to offer information they need by coming to a new city, although there's not very much to do right now due to COVID restrictions. Um, our first production is a digital uh, city tour around Leipzig um, to test the studio equipment and develop it for future projects. That's how it looks like while recording in our small um, studio, and mostly on the weekends and holidays um, to have as much science as possible in the university. And the video, the first video is in German. So I just brought uh, some impressions without um, or with muted, with muted uh, language, just to show you how it uh, should look like in the future or how it can look like. That's uh, from the city tour. That's our uh, campus for those who uh, are not familiar with it. Okay, I think I was very, very quick. Um, so we have um, time for uh, questions, um, but you can also write me an email. I will not be able to be in the workshop today because I um, the next uh, conference is waiting, but thank you for your kind attention and yeah, your questions, please. Thank you, Johannes. And I think Claudia Padovani wanted to ask a question. Johannes, thank you very much. This is super interesting. It's, uh, it's inspiring. So we will certainly look at the website. I was particularly interested in the comment you made about the material on YouTube that you have uh, um, on, on the different topics of career development, teaching and research. Uh, um, and I think we, we as uh, Sar Padova may be interested in this. Uh, because uh, we're planning some training activities for hosted scholars. Uh, and of course, this is, these are materials that may be useful, but we could actually consider maybe joining forces and maybe develop some, some joint 
activity on this. I wonder if these videos are um, in English or other languages, if they are openly accessible, and if you have a sense of uh, how many people and how these have been uh, used. Um, for the last part of the question, I, I have to look into um, the YouTube statistics. Um, that's nothing I can say from the scratch now. Um, the videos on our website that are already published are spoken in English, and we have subtitles in uh, German, Turkish, and Arabic. Thank you. Um, there's, since Johannes will be leaving and he, there will be no time for further questions, uh, if you have more questions, maybe we ask uh, them now. And I think Benedetta uh, asked something in the chat. Is that a new question, Benedetta? I think so, right? Yes, yes. How, you, um, um, how, how many are organized in, in the supporting team, in the voluntary supporting team? Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> It's Carmen and me, and um, thanks to BID, we have uh, one to two um, student assistants um, who help us. So we are a small team of two, and um, yeah, with the help of student assistants. That's even more amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. So can I have? Can I ask then? Because I think it's yeah, you've raised one of the big problems. No, it's it's. Claudia kind of mentioned which we're also facing the kind of academic integration and I think oh, it's been particularly difficult with COVID because the academics that are hosted haven't been able to come onto campus for a while and so also trying to create networks and channels. Have you had any feedback from you know the students or academics um, on the platform? Um, yeah first of all I think the feedback we get is um, thankful in the first step that there are at least any information available online. Um, but yeah, of course, we would like to, to do more in, in person. Um, that is not possible right now, but um, we hope we hope for that everything um, gets better and we can start the next year with a little um, lower restrictions. <laughs> Doesn't work now. <laughs> Um, I think uh, there's one more question in the chat and then Fiona also wanted to ask a question and then after that I think we will go to the break. So first of all, in the, maybe in the chat, um, how do you handle intellectual property rights for scientific researchers? I hope I get the question right. Um, as the platform is only the contact platform where you get in, into contact with others, um, I think we don't have so much trouble with um, intellectual property because everything um, they develop or um, do together is beside our platform. It's only the, the idea to, to make the contact and what they do together is not our business. And we only get um, to know about it, that something happened, for example, that um, a refugee was accepted um, as a fellow uh, anywhere, for example, for the Philip Schwarz initiative in Germany. That's a big one that supports uh, refugees. Um, we know about two um, refugees that got in contact to their supporters on, of a university by our website. And what they do afterwards um, is their business. So um, we don't have any, um, yeah, we don't want to have this intellectual property. It's, it's theirs, of course. I hope I got you right. Um, otherwise, please, uh, <laughs> please just get back on me. I think that's a very important point to have Chance for Science as a contact platform, maybe also in the in the context what we are talking about today, about not only talking about refugee students, but the students at risk. So I could imagine that people who are still sitting in other countries, like we talked about Belarus, and they will contact other persons or researchers via the platform. And then you can talk about how to come maybe to Germany or any other country and uh, how to apply for a scholarship. So there's a difference a different definition, I guess, how to use the platform. But anyway, Fiona wanted to ask something. No, I think Stephanie, you've basically said what I was going to say, but oh, just okay. to, tie Sorry. It in, you know, to tie it in with our, our kind of future discussions, you know, it, it says, you know, platform for, for refugees, but um, presumably uh, it could be used by any scholars, students at risk for other reasons, not necessarily with this sort of refugee status, which is often something legal rather than the fact of them being at risk. So presumably, you know, other, other 
other categories at risk uh, could benefit or, or would use your platform? Yeah, sure. And we are not checking the real status. So what yeah. we do is um, we check um, from the German professors, for example, we check if they are organized in the institution by email address or sometimes we, we Google a little bit um, if this is a real person because we in, in the beginning we were afraid of people um, registrating that are not um, in a good in a good idea. And um, thanks that was no problem over all the time, but um, we only check um, if everything is, yeah, if, if everything seems to be right. And so everyone is um, able to register. And what I said in the presentation, the, the, greatest, um, the greatest was that we saw that very many German professors and students are willing to help. That was not clear from the press and from the information that were, um, um, that were in the, in the press. Um, so that was, was a very nice um, feeling that there are so many people who want to help. And yeah, that's also a great uh, sign we saw from this uh, project. Always good to know to have so much support and which has a lot to do with this academic, promoting academic freedom. I guess that's also what our goal is, I guess. So thanks so much that you made the time uh, to present uh, the platform. And this also counts for the for the other presentations. Thank you all for speaking and for presenting. And I think it's time for a little break for us. Um, I don't know, do you, Fiona, do you think 10 minutes or five minutes? What's... Well, uh, okay. <laughs> well, let's say five minutes, which will become 10 minutes, but maximum, okay. 10, maximum 10 minutes. And so we can start at 11.45 with our breakout rooms. Okay, let's say time for a quick coffee and we meet each other again here for the breakout rooms. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, you very Hannes, much. Bye -bye. Thank you very much, Johannes. Yes. It was brilliant, great. Thank you. Anybody back? Oh. I'm back. <laughs> I'm back, well done, Thomas. Okay. <laughs> Great. I hope this is going to be cut out of the video. No, it's not. Me drinking coffee and congratulating Poma. That was really good. It was really clear. <laughs> Great. And I love Johannes. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. very interesting. You know. interesting. Chapeau. Even for us working at Leipzig University, because you might have the same problem at your university that there's so many things going on that sometimes even for us, we didn't interchange a lot. And uh, it's good to talk about some more uh, future projects, I guess, also with him. Absolutely. Good. So we've got lots to discuss. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Lots to do. <laughs> Lots to do, yes. We still have a year to go. <laughs> Let's see. Are we going to meet again then? Yeah. yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Are we going to meet again to have our kind of wrap up? Yeah. Yes, yes. I send a doodle. So hopefully we find enough, uh, <laughs> an appointment. Um, Hi, Benedetta. <laughs> Sorry. You, Hi. Are. How are you? <laughs> Amazing Good. webinar. Well, Poma, Thank Poma you so is, much and congratulations. Poma is more relaxed now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I am. Very good. That's great. Very thanks, interesting. thanks, Francesca and, and Claudia. I mean, I think it all sort of, um, there's lots of food for thought. Lots yeah. Food, lots to be done. You have so much to think about for our model, or our integrated plan for refugees. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, very true. Grand plan for, for, for scholars and students at risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now at least we have a lot of new ideas popping up, so that's oh, a good yes. thing always. <laughs> now, I, I think it is almost uh, absurd that we have enabling people and enabling refugees uh, as uh, at the core of Arcus and uh, of Action Line 2, and something so simple like enabling contacts <laughs> it can be, I mean, inspiring because we um, sometimes think of really very wide and, and complicated and complex uh, frameworks. Uh, enabling contacts, for example, in this case, has proved to be a really strategic and 
genial <laughs> way of tackling the, the, the problem of how to, to have uh, scholars and uh, refugees and, uh, and anyway, scholars at risk in a group, mm. in an in a inclusive group, because it's um, a, a group not only uh, of, of people with a refugee background and migrant background. But if I may add something, I think it's, it's an amazing experience. And then yeah. on the other side, my next question would have been, uh, you know, what kind of mechanism you have in support once you have enabled people to be in touch with each other and express their, their needs, uh, not just their feeling, because having a platform like this really makes all these uh, needs and different exigencies emerge, and then you have to provide a response. Yeah. So on, the, on the other side, you need to have scholarship, you need to have mentoring, you need to have an administration, you need to have a legal system in place, uh, and that's, of course, the main challenge, and that's why I think it's so relevant to think in terms of how to coordinate the different, uh, you know, the different experiences and different initiatives. Sure, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And I think what I really, the, I thought uh, in uh, Claudia and Francesca's talk, the idea of then having, you know, international students then involved in this advocacy and these learning experience, that's also so important because one thing that's come out of our discussions, you know, this idea of, you know, it's not just access, it's accompanying people, it's it's welcoming people. And, you know, the, the idea of mentorship and how, you know, your students at risk then become the mentors for new students at risk and you set up sort of uh, processes which can, you know, benefit everybody. So it's, um, but there's a lot to, to do and there's a lot to coordinate because it, it covers so many areas wishes and ideas in our head and maybe we can use it actually to discuss further in the breakout rooms i mean it's yeah, i think should we start really moving well transition. <laughs> should we start moving into the breakout rooms and hopefully we can answer some of those questions and we can see what arises we're a bit late on the schedule shall we still do 30 minutes or a bit late should we say 20, maybe 25 minutes in the breakout rooms perfect all right I think I, I, until 11.15 is fine, huh? uh, 12.15 is fine. Mm -hmm. And then maybe we've got three breakout rooms. So each breakout yeah. room can have three minutes to give feedback and then, yeah. Perfect. Then I will start the session now and then you can just, um, yeah, see the questions in the chat in a second. Okay. Thank you, Sabrina. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Other, how, how did things go in the other breakout rooms? Not enough time. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, there's always a lot to say. So now we need to proceed you know, with our, um, with, we've got 15 minutes now for very brief, bre uh, brief feedback on the breakout room discussions and then um, some final reflections to the morning. Um, so should we start with, uh, Thomas, would you like to start? As I can see you big on the screen for some reason, I think, I can, would you like to say something about your breakout room or would somebody in your breakout room like to? I would, I, I need a couple of minutes, but uh, maybe someone else would like to. Um... We, we were not able to discuss all of the questions very deeply, but exactly. but but uh, but still, we we saw that um, in a way, this webinar and this communication and collaboration we are having between Arcus Alliance and different organizations and their projects is is helping us and and uh, is in a way an answer to all a lot of our problems, because if we learn on how to create a, a, a combined strategies, create uh, collaborations and communications, we can uh, address a lot of situations and, 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 and solve them. That was the idea I got from, from, the, from our group. And um, yeah, we, we talked about the need of communication and the common uh, and the shared vision, the, integrated plan or, 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 or something which would help us uh, go further and, and react to various situations. I don't know, maybe Benedetta could, could add something uh, because we were not able to finish what we discussed, but... Uh... 
I don't have, I'm sorry, I don't have our summary in front of us, so it's a bit difficult right now. But anyway, we uh, talked about the need for ins an institutional commitment mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and policies. Um, we also said that we need a, a sort of uh, uh, centralized, um, um, I don't know, control room <laughs> where you can actually uh, uh, handle all the issues related to students at risk, scholars at risk, and, and so on. And that's missing in some of our universities. Um, we um, can you can you maybe share your screen and uh, because I, oh. I find it difficult right now to yeah, 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 wrap just, up yes. so quickly without being prepared to do that. <laughs> Sorry, just a second. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, because I, I don't know if we need to, to cover all the topics, but but uh, okay. As you mentioned, we, we need a shared okay policies, shared uh, ideas, and and. Uh, we need networking with other organizations yeah. like we were thinking about SAR, we were thinking about Co the Coimbra group and and, mm -hmm. the, and the, um, Claudia Padovani rightly enough said we need to start doing something together, maybe <laughs> starting one thing, but we need to, to, to be uh, operational and uh, that was another point. Uh, then we uh, underlined the fact that virtual exchanges and meetings uh, allowed, even in some experiences, uh, everyone to participate in. That would be a way to involve people uh, who are still in their own countries. And you, we have some examples from the Padova experience, Francesca Helms and Cla Claudia Padovani's experience in, mm -hmm. in particular. Our should become the way of our everyday life and, and the way we work. Uh, so um, we need to, uh, to have that as um, a commitment from our governances and our institutions to be able to do more things, uh, to be more um, practical and uh, to apply all the things we are thinking of. And, uh, and then uh, again, can you go uh, scroll it a little bit down? Thank yeah, you. I, I was not as, able to finish it. So, so yeah, yeah, as for our future plans, uh, we think that now in Arcus we have uh, uh, one action line dealing with uh, widening access, inclusion, and diversity. While in the future it would be more profitable uh, to have a kind of umbrella um, uh, called inclusion strategy covering uh, all the various needs um, and among those also the students at risk and scholars at risk uh, needs and uh, not having a work package, a dedicated work package, but having a, a sort of octopus, uh, um, <laughs> if you allow the metaphor, octopus uh, <laughs> inclusion strategies with tentacles in all the various work packages dealing with research, uh, PhD programs, uh, teaching learning, uh, outreach, um, European citizenship uh, and uh, European uh, heritage and identity and so on and so forth so that we can mm -hmm. tackle the issues of uh, students and refugees um, or at risk uh, situations uh, from an uh, overall cross-cutting cross-cultural interdisciplinary and intersectional um, point of view and strategy yes. i don't know if uh, yeah, anyone yeah. else wants to add anything <laughs> that's fine thank you very much for the moment because maybe the sort of things will be repeated come together from the from the other groups and we can tie up at the end but thank you uh Toma and Benedetta very much for that and Helen and um Stephanie would you like to yeah maybe I don't know my colleagues Helen or Alexa or someone else from our group could maybe um sum it up I don't know yeah, I maybe I can just because we started um, we started our breakout session with a small question. Maybe I can just share it. Can you can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we our initial question was: um, Are there any support structures for students and scholars at risk? Um, at your home institution, or do you have any ide ideas, wishes, or suggestions what should be um, um, implemented? And that was like our our uh, result. And then we just, yeah, I think the outcome was that we discussed that there are several structures 
um, which can be used for international students um, or refugee students, but um, in our universities, um, there are no special programs for scholars um, or students at risk. And we highlighted uh, the three C's. Maybe you, you want to continue speaking about them, Steffi? Um, yeah, I don't know why, but I came, came up with the term, the, the, the three C's, which is about collaboration, communication, and coordination. And I think these are three very important um, points to make a program be uh, running successful, I, I guess, also here. And I think the, the first step we have about communication is now that we exchange um, ideas and what's actually going on. And then we also need the terms of, uh, yeah, like coordinate, coordinate, coordination, especially also on a European level, because I think there is a lot going on, maybe not in all our universities, but in all our countries. And now we are a European, a European network that might has, yeah, has to, has to have a look on, on a broader level on an, um, then on the, not only sticking to the national boxes or the national um, rules, but beyond, go beyond that. And for that, we need a lot of coordination and communication. But I think there is something that we, we as Europe can make work, especially supporting other countries like um, also Lithuania, um, we have seen that, that things are going on there as well, and it's a very successful program, but maybe all European countries have to ship in, in a way, in order to promote this kind of academic freedom that we, um, that we are also fond of. It's not just one country who can put all, uh, bring in all the support, but we all have to work together and, um, yeah, to find something, a structure that we, yeah, collaborate and, and um, exchange and bring all ideas together on them maybe broader level than just on the national one. So these were just kind of ideas that just were flo floating in our group. And maybe you have seen in the chat that there was added a fourth C community, <laughs> which fits exactly what you just Very said. Very nice. <laughs> True. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. So I now, I'm, I, I don't know, Francesca and Barbara, shall I sort of, I'll, I'll share then if you want, I'll share my kind of notes. And um, then if either of you want to add something from our discussion, you know, the same themes came up. Um, it's not very well organized here, but you know, talking about raising awareness. Yeah, I mean, one thing that just, you know, arose a lot in our group yes, was once again this, you know, networking amongst networks, basically, and uh, how, you know, in ARCUS can work with SAR and other networks to raise awareness, for example, which was our first question. Um, we were thinking, first of all, this was the issue of whether, you know, ARCUS could in some way take a stand in the case of humanitarian, uh, humanitarian crisis and one model could be these um, um, the statements issued by SAR International, for example, for Afghanistan, which we could look at and adapt. Um, on the 9th of December, we know that SAR, we, we found out that SAR are presenting their free to think report. And this could also maybe involve ARCUS members uh, getting students involved in networking, um, focusing, for example, on Belarus and Afghanistan, there's going to be a physical event in Padova, but also, you know, a streamed webinar. So this could be a way to bring two networks together, for example. Now, um, we one thing that we also discussed was how, um, yes, the structural problems inherent in various universities do arise when you host scholars. So it's really, you know, the practice trying to put something into practice which helps you realize what you need. So these are all ideas which can feed um, into, I think it's related, you know, scholars at risk, students at risk, related to ARCUS, uh, our um, aim of, uh, of the, the integrated plan. So these are um, some things to keep in mind. And the fact that, and this is why the um, Johanna's last presentation was very uh, interesting. You know, contacts, it's been found that contacts with other academics can be difficult. So, you know, efforts to, to enhance these contacts. Um, we talked, yes, collaboration came up again, you know, getting students and staff, Marquis, to collaborate on SAR-related themes. 
hosting activities. There could be, you know, with a, with a scholar at risk who is hosted in one Arcus uh, University, maybe there could be some, you know, arrangement for exchange or going from one Arcus University to another, if I understood that right, Francesca, you can correct me. And um, then um, we've got the question of, yes, um, SAR has a, you know, a procedure for assessing whether a scholar is at risk, whether there is there's some sort of threat. There are some with uh, refugee status in the host countries, but I think, you know, also we need to look at the countries themselves. If we're thinking of our students at risk, as in Thomas' case, you know, looking at the country they come from to see, you know, if there is an emergency situation which may mean that they can be considered at risk. And as also Francesca mentioned, there are students who are may become at risk simply because they have left their countries and spent a period abroad, uh, as in Patrick Zaki, who was studying in, in Bologna. And then when he went back, he was arrested. Um, various ideas, um, you know, ARCWAS could also support perhaps people at risk in their own countries with online placements, financial support. Um, the, um, Francesca, this is what this is that um, Francesca talked about. Um, this is something different. Um, a, a project for financial support off university where Turkish scholars in German were helping Turkish scholars in the country who had been dismissed from their jobs. Online training in preparation for leaving the country, virtual exchange. These are all the issues that came up. So I will stop now. And um, as Francesca says, sharing knowledge, developing an integrated plan would save a lot of people a lot of time. Okay. Uh, okay. And the, 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 the 9th of December, we're not sure about the physical event. But, um, and Claudia, you wanted to add something. Uh, yes, just, I, I have another C. I don't know if that, <laughs> if that <laughs> relates, um, if that should be strategically inserted in the program, but I think it's good for us to keep in mind that we've been uh, using like positive C's in terms of how to work together and build things. But the other one that I'm thinking of is a C as for confront. And I think as a network, uh, it's crucial that on the one side, we keep in mind that we're confronting risks and challenges of different type that we've mentioned. But seat. we're also, we may be confronting resistance, including from our own university. And that is something that was mentioned in our group. So we also talked about the possibility of having an initiative as Arcus, uh, uh, different universities, like the different rectors uh, signing a letter on the occasion of some kind of situation emergency. And we need to be aware of the resistance that may emerge uh, when it comes to like geopolitical concerns, diplomatic concerns, uh, we've already seen this. So in our notes, uh, we, had, we had this idea of um, starting a conversation on the, the core of internationalization and how universities sits within that. And that may be an interesting seminar for Arcus to, to you know, work on. That's something that we as SAR Italy were also discussing with SAR Sweden, but we haven't gone that far. It could be very interesting to join forces and do that together. Yes, thank you very much. Definitely joining forces because, you know, I like, I just wanted to, you know, in the, the, the group, the, um, the word cloud we saw um, in the from um, Stephanie and and um, Helen's group, <laughs> where we saw the less the less barriers that sort of brought us a full circle back to the very beginning of this webinar. You know, with where where people were literally being pushed back across, which was a very uh, strong uh, start to the to the discussion. So. Um, not to be forgotten, obviously, yet yeah, the context in which we are working. I don't know if now anybody has any other questions, comments, so that we can wrap things up. Thank you, everybody, though. Thank you for you know all your the, the great participation in the um, in the breakout rooms and for all our speakers. Does anybody want to say anything? Steffi, would you like to go? I also want to express my thank you to everybody who's so dedicated always to the um, 
to the topic and to our um, uh, task force. It's, uh, it's always good to work with you. And I know that also Thomas and Fiona, you put a lot of work into it. Also Helen and Johanna, so thanks for that and for all the speakers. And I definitely think we should be in contact. And as I wrote also, we have for, for next year, our goal would be to create this kind of um, perfect model. <laughs> to support students or refugee students but I think today we learned it's not only about refugee students it's about students at risk in general and we should definitely integrate it into our model as well and I think that's what I take from this session as well uh, starting working from next week on on that kind of model um, that we have to yeah we have to keep a lot of persons in mind and um, see how we can add integrate everybody so that no one is left behind or that everybody is included. In. Yeah. Yes, we've got some more comments and thanks. Uh, a comment on the, yes, the preponderance of uh, female participants. We did have uh, one or two, uh, we did have one or two male participants, but uh, <laughs> They haven't. Uh, they haven't uh, made it to the end of the meeting, so we, we're left with a, a W, a big, big W, as along with the, the very many C's. I don't know if anybody I, else has I don't a know Tom, I wants to, Tom, I wants to say something. Um, no, I just wanted to say thank you. This was a, a great webinar and and the great discussion. So, thank you to all of you. <laughs> Yeah, I also want to say uh, really a huge thank you to uh, Stephanie, Fiona, Thomas, and the whole uh, task force 2.6 and to the participants, our speakers. And as we were saying in our breakout room, um, in, in times when Europe is proving to be so disunited, uh, disunited as regards the um, migration and, and, ref and refugee issue, um, I think we in Arcus can try to be as united as possible and uh, really profit from this alliance to show that we are united and um, from a policy level to our vision, to our guidance and to the uh, implementation of this uh, integrated plan that uh, our task force is going to develop. So thank you. Thank you so much. Well. Goodbye, everybody, and uh, <laughs> enjoy the rest of your day. And we will be in touch very collaboratively. With we've also got our uh, we've got Aurora there as well. So we've got you know. <laughs> I think as soon as we put the recording online, we will let you know. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank Ciao. You Have a nice bye. day. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye everyone.